Now, it's important to understand how tissue fluid is formed and how it is reabsorbed. And to understand this, we need to think about the physiology of the capillary. So as you probably know, the capillary is just a single layer of vascular endothelium. It's comprised of squamous cells on an external basement membrane. And between the individual capillary cells, there are very small gaps. So it's not an absolute barrier in most parts of the body. There are small gaps between the individual capillary cells. And this is important because water is able to get out and get back into the circulatory system through these small gaps. Now, blood enters a capillary from an arteriole and the pressure in the arterioles is relatively high. So when the blood enters a capillary at the arterial end of the capillary, the pressure in that blood is going to be around about 32 millimetres of mercury. We describe this as the hydrostatic pressure. That is the pressure of the fluid inside the capillary. But when you get to the venous end of the capillary, and of course the capillaries are going to drain into venules and into veins, and the venous system is a lower pressure system than the arterial system. This means that at the venous end of the capillary, the blood pressure, that is the hydrostatic pressure exerted by the blood on the vessel wall, on the capillary wall, is down to about 12 millimetres of mercury. So at the arterial end of the capillary, the blood pressure is 32. At the venous end of the capillary, the blood pressure is 12. So we have a relatively high blood pressure at the arterial end of the capillary. And because the blood pressure is relatively high at the arterial end of the capillary, this pressure forces the small water molecules out through the gaps between the capillary cells, between the vascular endothelial cells. And it forces the water out from the blood in the capillary into the tissue fluid, which is bathing the cells. In other words, at the arterial end of the capillary, tissue fluid forms as a result of the hydrostatic pressure of the blood there is a shift of water from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment. Water molecules which were in the plasma of the blood are now in the tissue fluid in the interstitial compartment, bathing the cells. Now blood of course contains large molecules, particularly the plasma proteins. And the most abundant plasma protein is albumin. Albumin is a very large molecule. This means blood is a colloid. And colloids which contain large molecules are going to have an osmotic potential. Now you might remember that osmosis is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane under the influence of osmotic pressure. And osmosis is a watering down effect. It waters things down. It's like a waterfall. The water goes down. And what this means in practice is that water moves from watery areas to less watery areas in order to try and dilute the less watery area. Now, the tissue fluid is a watery medium, but the blood is a colloidal medium. So the blood has these large proteins which exert an osmotic suction effect. This means osmosis is going to tend to want to move water molecules from the tissue fluid back into the blood. In other words, we can say that the osmotic effect of the plasma proteins generates a suction effect. So the plasma proteins in the blood are sucking water back through the semi-permeable membrane and remember that the capillary membrane, the vascular endothelial membrane of the capillary is semi-permeable and these proteins are sucking the water back in. There's an osmotic suction effect and we can actually measure this. We sometimes call it the colloidal osmotic pressure of the plasma and it's around about 25 millimetres of mercury. It's sucking back in. So if we think about the original figures we talked about, at the arterial end of the capillary, we said there's 32 millimetres of mercury of hydrostatic pressure pushing out, while there's also 25 millimetres of osmotic pressure sucking back in. This means there's a net filtration effect of 7 millimetres of mercury forcing water from the blood into the tissue spaces.
This means that tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure exceeds the osmotic pressure and there's net movement of water from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment. However, at the venous end of the capillary, where the hydrostatic pressure is lower, remember we said it's only 12 millimetres of mercury pushing out, but there's still 25 millimetres of pressure sucking in. This means at the venous end of the capillary, the osmotic pressure sucking in is much greater than the hydrostatic blood pressure pushing out. In fact, the difference is 13 millimetres of mercury. So there's 25 millimetres of mercury sucking in. There's only 12 millimetres of mercury pushing out. And this means that the osmotic pressure at the venous end of the capillary exceeds the blood pressure, exceeds the hydrostatic pressure. So you're going to get net reabsorption of water back into the venous end of the capillary. So this means the tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure exceeds the osmotic pressure. And it means that tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary because the osmotic pressure exceeds the hydrostatic pressure. And this, of course, is very useful because it means that we get tissue fluid. And this is not some sort of accident. Tissue fluid is going to fill the spaces, it's going to fill the interstitial spaces between the tissue cells and between the cells and the capillaries. And this tissue fluid bathes the cells. It keeps the cells moist and it stops them from drying out. And also the tissue fluid supplies the essential diffusional medium between the capillary and the blood in the capillary and the cytoplasm and the cytosol in the individual cells. Because the oxygen can't just jump from the red cells in the blood into the tissue cells. The oxygen must first diffuse through the vascular endothelium into the tissue fluid and from the tissue fluid it diffuses into the tissue cells. And it's the same with all the nutrients. Glucose, for example, must first diffuse from the plasma where it's carried into the tissue fluid and only from the tissue fluid does it diffuse into the cells where it can be used by the mitochondria. And it's the same with waste products. So the cells are developing carbon dioxide as a waste product of metabolic processes that has to diffuse from the cell into the tissue fluid back into the blood. It's the same with other waste products of cellular metabolism, such as nitrogen containing waste products. The waste nitrogen must first diffuse from the cells into the tissue fluid and only then can it get back into the blood. So this tissue fluid is essential as the diffusional medium and it's constantly being replaced and constantly being replenished because it's formed at the arterial end of the capillary, washes over the cells and the water is then reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. And this is also a good example of how body fluids are compartmentalized. We can see from this physiology that the water in the blood is in the intravascular compartment. We can see that the water in the tissue fluid is in the interstitial compartment. And we also noted that there was cytosol within the cytoplasm of the cells, which of course is the fluid in the intracellular compartment. So we notice that body fluids are compartmentalized, but we also know that there's movement of water in between the compartments. And maybe we could look at a reason why this is important. Let's imagine you're out walking, it's a hot day, you're in an arid environment and water is not readily available, but it's hot. So you have to produce sweat in order to thermoregulate. If you don't thermoregulate, you'll become hyperthermic and you'll die. So you have to sweat. And the sweat glands are perfused by capillaries. So the water that is in the sweat has come from the water in the plasma. But on a hot day, if you're walking for several hours away from a source of water, you can easily lose a litre or two litres or three litres or four litres in sweat. And of course, that's more than the total volume of water that you have in the plasma. So if you were to lose one or two litres of water from the plasma and that was not replaced, you would become hypovolemic, you would become shocked, you wouldn't maintain a blood pressure, 
and you wouldn't be able to take effective action. You would not be able to carry on walking until you got to the next supply of water. But fortunately, the physiology of fluid compartmentalization has taken account of this. This is all worked out already. Because what happens when you lose water from the blood, that means there's less water in the blood, that increases the concentration of the plasma proteins. That makes the plasma more osmotic. That means that there's more water sucked from the interstitial fluid into the intravascular compartment. That means that the volume of the blood is replenished and restored by osmotic movement of water from the tissue fluid back into the plasma. That maintains intravascular volume. The volume of the blood is maintained. And if you maintain the volume of the blood, that means you can maintain blood pressure. That means you can keep walking and that means you can take effective action. So what this means is, even although you only have three litres of water in the blood at any one time, you've essentially got 10 litres of reserve fluid in the tissue spaces, because that will move from the tissue space into the blood as it's required, as it's sucked into the blood by the osmotic potential of the plasma proteins. So the more water that's lost from the blood, the more osmotic the blood will become, the more fluid will be sucked from the interstitial space to replenish intravascular volume. And indeed, if the volumes of tissue fluid go down, then fluid will start moving from the intracellular space into the interstitial space to replenish the fluid in the interstitial space, which can then replenish the fluid in the blood. And this means that in essence, you have 30 litres of spare fluid in the intracellular compartment that can keep us going through a hot, sweaty day until we reach a water supply. This is how the body can maintain blood pressure, even although there is a very significant dehydration. Now, you're going to feel remarkably thirsty, but you're going to maintain a blood pressure. And as long as you can maintain a blood pressure, you can take effective action to get to the next water supply. This is part of the physiology of the body that is designed to allow us to survive. We are survival machines and something as simple as the physiology and the exchange of fluid over a capillary vascular endothelial membrane is actually part of the survival mechanisms which are designed into the very fabric of animals and into your very anatomy and histology as a human being.